God's holy days are called the days of your gladness, your times of joy, according to Numbers 10.10. 10. That's what he calls them. Uh, one of the most joyous times of anybody's life should be and is the wedding day. That included the wedding day of God Almighty. For even just being, or even just being a part of a wedding, it's also a, a usually a very fun time, isn't it? And um, whether you're the bride and groom, or gr or groom or not, or whether you're there as a guest, in August of 1975, I experienced a time of my joy. My uh, wife and I got married you know, about that time. I was standing in a beautiful hall. There was a minister there. There was my best man, my brother, and there were some friends who also were with me. And we're standing there in our tuxedos. Very excited, because today I was going to now be a married man. And it took a while, it seemed, for the music to start. You know, seconds seemed like a long time. And then the music started, and there she was. My beautiful wife. Married her in 1975. <clears throat> I was very excited. Could hardly wait for her to get down the aisle. Her father was with her. And then uh, she stood there. I went beside her. Minister did his thing. I don't remember very much of it because I was just excited to uh, to be married. And uh, moments later, we were saying our I do's, and I gave her one big whopping kiss, and we were husband and wife. Happy time, happy time. We're still married, in spite of all my imperfections. We're still married. And now, not long ago, not long to go now. There's going to be another wedding. And I'm going to be in it. I hope so. I want to be in it, and I hope you'll be in it. And I hope you're excited about being in it. This one is to be not as a groom this time, but this time to be part of a bride. It's hard for men to think of being a bride, but anyway, that's what it is. If I'm there as not part of the bride, then I'll be there, I hope, at least as a guest. At least as a guest. And... What I am and what you will be at the wedding are God's decision to be. But I know I want to be there, and I know I want to be the bride, if at all possible. I pray about that. I pray that I be counted worthy to escape the things to come about soon. And I pray that I be counted worthy to be part of the bride. I hope you're praying that. Remember, in Matthew 22, it says that many were called to the wedding, and all the original ones called to the wedding gave one reason after another why they couldn't make it to the wedding after all. Something more important came up. Something more pressing, something more urgent, they thought. And so others were invited, both good and bad, it says in Matthew 22. Both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So anyway, let's not, let's not let that be you or me, you or I, who say I have more important things to do than pray about being counted worthy to be part of the bride or to be in that marriage supper. Today I'm going to talk about that, the wedding of Yeshua, the Son of God to his bride, the church. Some uh, months ago, or we, I think it was months ago now, I gave a sermon about how our marriages are supposed to picture the wedding between Christ and the church. And so definitely the Bible is very clear he's going to marry the bride. Ephesians 5.32, I speak a mystery to you. I speak concerning Christ and the church. After he gave all this stuff about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her and so on, and that he may present her to himself without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Okay, so that's the way we husbands are supposed to really be working on in our relationship with our wife, the way Christ looks at the church. Now, recently, I also gave a sermon, very recently, about Pentecost and its primary well-known meanings of how on this day the Holy Spirit came, on this day God married Israel, on this day the law was given, on this day it was all about first fruits. All about the early, early harvest, culminating in the, in the early wheat, wheat harvest. And, uh, and Christ tie in to that at the, at the wave sheaf day. Peter's whole sermon, in fact, on, in Acts 2 about Pentecost was about Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Um, how Pentecost was about giving God's spirit. Uh, how that spirit was a picture of a wedding ring. The almost, almost the identical same word for wedding ring and earnest or down payment. And uh, so much more. And why uh, the book of Ruth and Bo uh, the book of Ruth is read the story of the wedding between Ruth and Boaz at Pentecost time. How the high priest uh, took two leaven, large leaven loaves, large that might have some bearing too, and what I'll say more next time. Uh, raised his hands uh, with the two loaves to heaven, 
and then brought them back down again. What did that picture, what, what does that have to uh, picture? They were large lemon loads, loaves. And so anyway, I hope on the day of Pentecost you had points like that discussed with you um, and how it was so tied into Wave Sheaf Day during the days of Unleavened Bread, which pictured Christ being accepted for us. Today I want to focus on another huge aspect of Pentecost. We've kind of talked about it, but I want to talk about it in much more detail, and that is the wedding of the Lamb to his church. And when it is, where it is, who will be there, who are the guests, who is the bride, and as much as we can gather from Scripture, anyway, uh, that's what we'll be talking about. So, and who is the Son of God is, of course, the Lamb. That's the Son of God. Uh, Behold the Lamb of God, okay, who takes away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said in John 1, 29. He is excited. He's getting married. And, uh, but to whom? When will it happen? Where? And so forth. So, will you be there? Will you be ready for it? So, I hope you're interested in the topic. And even if you've heard sermons about the wedding before, I hope you'll hear this one and maybe you'll pick up a few things that you'll find interesting. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of LightOnTheRock.org. Welcome all of you. Many people from all over the world come to this site now and we really appreciate that. I don't hear much from many of you except a very small handful. So those of you who do take the time to write or email me or or whatever, some encouragement, uh, thank you for it. It's like lifting my hand, my weary hands up, like uh, Aaron and her lifted up Moses' hands um, in Exodus. I think it's Exodus 17, somewhere in there. Anyway, let's read in uh, Revelation 19 about a very, very joyful wedding coming up. And thank all of you who do come, and thank all of you who do take the time to write a note of encouragement um, on, on comments or either as an email. I, I, I do appreciate it. Revelation 19, verses 6 to 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Let, that means let's praise. It's all praise God. It's all praise Yah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And let us be glad and rejoice. Give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. They, she was given, was granted to her fine linen. The wedding's back in, back in uh, Peter and Paul's day, and Yeshua's day on the earth. When you went to a wedding, they didn't want you wearing whatever you could come with. It wasn't good enough. And so the, uh, the person putting on the wedding, especially if they're very wealthy, uh, got wedding garments to give to each one. So they looked really, really nice. Uh, much nicer than they would maybe normally. A lot of people back then had one garment. That was it. Very expensive to have more than one back then before the, the, the loom was made. I mean, the massive loom, you know, the, the big looms we have today. So to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, These are the true sayings of God. I think it's interesting here, at least four different groups are mentioned here. The, the loud thunderings and voices, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. That's probably the angelic host. And then we, we, uh, we have uh, the, the groom being mentioned, that he's happy and he's glad and he's getting married. His wife is mentioned. That's the third group. So there's a bride, there's a groom, there's the attendants, the, the, the angels. And then there's apparently those who are guests who are called to be part of the wedding supper. In verse 9, I don't think verse 9 is really talking about the bride. I think the verse 9 is talking about the guests who are there. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper. It doesn't say blessed are those who are called to be the bride. Bless, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper implies to me the audience, if you will, the guests uh, who are also there. And we'll talk much more about who those are in part two. Now, it seems to me that, that that's the way it's described here. There is a coming wedding. God is getting married. Now, before Yeshua, the Word of God, the Son of God, could get married, remember, he had been divorced. Now, he didn't get divorced right away. He didn't get divorced upon the first act of infidelity. The first act of infidelity was the gold calf. And it went on and on and on and on from there for hundreds of years before he divorced her. 
And so that's an example for us too. God hates divorce, yet even he got divorced. In Isaiah 50, verse 1, he says that in Malachi 2, by the way, that he hates divorce. In Isaiah 50, verse 1, thus says Jehovah, where's the certificate of your mother's divorce whom I have put away? Okay, so he, God definitely had divorced Israel. Jeremiah 3, verses 6 to 9. Jeremiah 3, verses 6 to 9. Jehovah also said to me in the days of Josiah, the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up on every high mountain, every under every green tree, and there played the harlot. Basically, the high mountains and the green trees had to do with the Asherah poles, the um, phallic symbols, the sexual symbols, uh, the idolatry. Uh, idolatry, in God's view, was harlotry. Uh, he was the husband. He was the one they should have been worshiping, not some stone or wood piece. And I said, after she'd done all these things, return to me, but she did not return. So God did try to wake up his bride and say, look, I don't like what you're doing. I'm willing to forgive you, like Isaiah chapter 1 says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Come back to me. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Jeremiah 3 verse 8 now, And I saw that for all the causes for which black backsliding Israel had committed adultery, he's talking about spiritual adultery, infidelity, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister did not fear, but went and played the heart as well. So God got divorced. The law says, and well, Jesus said it, I think in Matthew 19, but also here in Romans 7, which we'll post here shortly, that as long as your husband lives, even if you're divorced, you can't go marry someone else, it says in Romans 7, unless the mate dies. Romans 7, verses 2 to 4, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if her, while her husband lives, she marries someone else, another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. She's no longer an adulteress, although she's married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. And you know who that is, that we should bear fruit to God. So now that Christ died, for that matter, Israel all died. Now that we've all died, there is now possible, including God, when, when, I, when I say God died, the Son of God died, God the Father continued to live as God, so God didn't really entirely die, the Son did, but not God the Father. But anyway, since Christ died, and since Israel that married Christ has since died, there can be a wedding, and this time to Christ, and it will be this time to the church, to the ecclesia. So the word of God, Yeshua the Messiah, is getting married. We'll turn to Matthew 22 next. Where will that wedding be? A lot of you uh, dismiss the idea of going to heaven at all. And I did for many years until the late 80s. I, or sometime in the 80s, I started to believe that, no, we are going to heaven to get married. And there are reasons for that. In fact, uh, I would say now that the heavenly Jerusalem is indeed a prize, a reward, exclusively to the people who are called the ecclesia, the first call, the first fruits. There will be other cities on earth that other people can live in, but heavenly Jerusalem coming back down to earth, that is my goal, that is my reward, to be part of that. It's even called the bride in Revelation 21. It says she's adorned, Jerusalem above is adorned as a bride for her husband, and um, that's because that's where the bride is going to be living. And we're going to go there to get married. I really believe that. So even if you think you don't believe that, please listen to this. If you believe you already believe that, I think you'll get a lot of extra points in this sermon by listening to it. So in Matthew 22, uh, God gives a parable about, oh, Jesus, the groom, gives a parable about God wanting a son, his son, to get married. And that's what he clearly states here. And so the groom is the Son of God. Matthew 22, verses 1 and 2. Jesus answered, spoke to the man again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven, heaven, note that, 
the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. We know who the son has to be. That has to be Yeshua, the son of God. He, he arranged a certain marriage for his son. And a certain king then has to, has to be God the Father. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, or ever read it or say it, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, hallowed be your name. In heaven. So we know the king has to be God, and we know he is in heaven. Later on in Matthew 22, it goes on to say how the king came in to uh, meet the guests, and so on. So, where's that king? He's in heaven. Now, when God, the Word, the, the one we now know as the Son, married Israel at Mount Sinai, it was a very frightening event. The whole mountain quaked. The whole mountain was on fire. A big billowing smoke going up high into the sky. Could be seen for miles and miles around, no doubt. There was a loud blast of the shofar, the angelic shofar, which the word picture for shofar is the prince speaks. The, the prince speaks. Interesting, I think. Anyway, let's go back and read. Of course, you know in Exodus 19 and then Exodus 20, when God began to speak, the people came to Moses and said, don't let him do this again. It's too scary. You talk to us. We don't want to have hear God's voice again. We might all die. The mountain was all on fire. God had told everybody, don't come and don't touch this mountain. You can touch it, but don't. If you touch it, you're going you're gonna to die. And then later on, God called Moses to come up to him, to a mountain that was on fire. I really believe Moses walked through fire during those 40 days and 40 nights because the mountain was on fire. No wonder he was quaking and fearful. <laughs> it says in Hebrews 12, let's read it. Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 19, You have not come to the mountain that may be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, Hebrews 12, 19 now, and the sound of the trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. It's not going to be like that the second time. Hebrews 12, picking up in 21, and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Remember, God did call Moses to come to the top where he was. That was all on fire. I really believe Moses walked through fire. Verse 22, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We have come to heavenly Jerusalem. There it is, folks. To an innumerable company of angels. Just hundreds and hundreds of millions, maybe billions of them and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Church of the firstborn registered in heaven and uh, registered where? In heaven. You've come to heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to Mount Zion to God, the judge of all. Where's all this taking place? Heavenly Jerusalem. So this tells us clearly we're going to heavenly Jerusalem. This time, yes, I believe Yeshua comes back to the earth on the clouds, sends his angels out to collect us after the great tribulation and the heavenly signs. And then from there, and we're changed to spirit. From there, we then are taken by him back up to heaven in an instant, in the blink of an eye. I don't think it'll take light years to get there. It'll be blink of an eye. Boom, you're going to be there. And, um, and then we'll get married in heaven. And then we all come back on white angelic steeds with Christ. with his, He's the Lord of hosts. He's, he's got all his angelic hosts with him and his bride this time. And uh, we come back to earth, face the armies that are there, uh, get rid of them, take over the reins of government over the whole earth, and we shall reign with him a thousand years, it says in Revelation 20. So let's get back to the wedding now itself. Back to the wedding. Revelation 19, I remember, I remember I showed you, it says, there were voices in heaven saying, Hallelujah, the bride, the, the, the wedding's ready, the bride's made herself ready, and the two wave loaves are raised up, and so on. So let's, let's look at it again. Revelation 19, verse 1. Uh, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. 
the context of where that wedding takes place. That's what I'm talking about now. I read Revelation 19, verse 6 earlier. Let's go back to verse 1. Revelation 19, verse 1. After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. And uh, so anyway, then verse 4 explains how there's 24 elders and four living creatures before the throne, before God who sat on the throne. Where is all of that? That's just two verses before it starts talking about the wedding. That is in heaven, in God's presence. Verse 5, and then a voice came from the throne. So, I mean, here it is. The 24 elders are there. The four living creatures are there. The seraphim, you know, and a great multitude. Verse 1, in heaven. And then verse 6 and 7 starts talking about the marriage of the Lamb. So the context of this marriage of the Lamb is in heaven. We're not staying there. That will, will be our home, but that, we got to come back to earth to reign and rule and, and work here on earth. But that will be our home. There's another picture that shows it being in heaven. Isaac and Rebekah. When Abraham, who I, I think pictured God the Father, wanted a son for his son Isaac, who pictured Jesus Christ, he sent his servant, his messenger, to go find a bride for Isaac. And uh, he was told, don't ever, ever let Isaac go back there. We've crossed over. That's the root meaning of Hebrew, Eber, uh, is to cross over. Uh, we came over the, the Yardan, the Jordan, and we're now here in the promised land that we're going to have. We must never go back. It's a lesson for us, too. Must never look back, must never go back. Once God calls you out, like uh, Lot and his wife. And anyway, uh, Abraham told him to go find a bride for Isaac and then bring her back here. Bring her back where? To me, to where the father is. We'll see that in Genesis 24. Um, you can see Genesis 24, verses 1 to 4, everything I've just said. And then Genesis 24, a miraculous finding of Rebekah, and God brought them together uh, to the servant. If you're unfamiliar with the story, read Genesis 24. It's very exciting. And Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the man, the servant, took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac came by, okay, so now they're getting close back to where Isaac is, many days later. Isaac came from the way of Beher Lahai Roy, for he had dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. By the way, I would, I'm not a betting man, it's an expression, okay, but I'd lay a bet that this happened right around Pentecost time. It, it just makes sense to me. I don't know that, but I think it is very, very likely because uh, God always does things on certain schedules. And what they picture, they picture. Then Rebekah, verse 64, let's pick it up again. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, for she had said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And he'd said, it was my master. It's my master. So she took a veil, covered her face, and, uh, her, and then the servant told Isaac all the incredible things that happened, how God answered their prayers, how she did exactly what he prayed for, that he, she offered water, not just for him, but also for all the camels as well. And then uh, verse 67 is where I'm leading to. Verse 67, let's read it. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So Sarah had died some time before. They'd left her tent up. You know, when someone dies, it's hard just to pretend nothing was ever there, the person never existed. So we often leave up pictures of our uh, child who died. We lost a child a long time. We kept the pictures up. Um, so anyway, the, Sarah's tent was there. And now... What's the meaning of all? By the way, the, the word loved. This is the first time I believe the word loved is uh, in the Bible. When picturing Christ loving his church, picturing Isaiah, I mean Isaac, 
loving Rebecca. I say I won't be around for a while yet. Okay, this is the first time love is used. But Isaac took Rebekah into his mother's tent, and there they consummated their marriage. Galatians 4, verses 22 to 26 tells us what Sarah's tent pictures. Has everything to do with this. Galatians 4, 22 to 26. It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman, that's Hagar, and the other by a free woman, that would be Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman, he who, uh, that's Ishmael they're talking about, who was of the bondwoman, was born the regular way according to the flesh, having sex, getting pregnant, having a baby. Okay, that's what he's saying. And he of the free woman, Isaac he's talking about now, came through a promise. Somehow, miraculously, from people who no longer could do it, no longer could, uh, they just couldn't do it. They have a baby. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, and Ishmael for that matter. And for this, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. And when Paul wrote this, was literally in bondage to the Romans. Verse 26, but Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So Paul says that Sarah represents the new covenant, not a renewed covenant. Jeremiah 31 says, I'll make a new covenant with them, not, not like the one I made with them when I, came to, when I brought them out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai. Not like that. It's a brand new covenant. It's not a renewed rehash. So Sarah pictures the new covenant and Jerusalem above, it says. Jerusalem above. So when Isaac took Rebekah into his mother's tent, I really feel he was doing something to scream at us. A big clue. When you get married to Christ, it will be in Jerusalem above. Isn't that exciting? I think it is. I hope you get excited about things like this. This, this doesn't become just a doctrinal point. This is something that is involving you. You are going to marry Yeshua. You, at bare minimum, should be a guest there. You should be very excited about this. On top of that, in John 14, we have that famous statement by Yeshua to his disciples. So in the last evening where he had the Last Supper with them and all of that, I have a full-length sermon called, I Go Prepare a Place for You. Just type in, in the search bar, I Go Prepare, and it'll pop up if you want more details. But John 14, verses 1 to 3, I'm reading out of the CJB, the Complete Jewish Bible. Don't let yourselves be disturbed. Let not your heart be troubled. Okay, don't let yourself be disturbed. Trust in God. Trust in me, too. In my Father's house are many places to live. It says mansions in the King James. In my Father's house are many places to live. If there weren't, I would have told you. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going back to my father's home in heaven, right? To prepare a place for you. It's not just an office. I really think it's a literal dwelling place. Each one of us will have our own homes. Up there in heavenly Jerusalem, where I'll live, where I'll work. Where, that's my hometown. That's my, where, where I'm born in, so to speak. Just like those who have to work in Washington, D.C., they might live in Nebraska or Utah or Virginia or something, but they work in Washington, D.C. We'll work on the earth. We'll rule and reign for a thousand years. But our home will be heavenly Jerusalem, and we'll be able to zip back and forth. I'm sure I'll say more about that next time. So don't let yourself be, be disturbed. I go prepare a place for you since I'm going, I'm, verse 3, and preparing a place for you. I will return to take you. With me. Take you where? Back down to earth? Well, eventually we will, but I will return to take you with me so that where I am, you may be also. So far, I think we're getting a lot of indication it's not, the wedding's not going to be on earth someplace or up in the sky someplace. The wedding's going to be in heavenly Jerusalem. And then there's more, the two leaven loaves. Remember, uh, they're both leavened, and they were raised, uh, raised up. 
on Pentecost. The wave sheaf during the Days of Unleavened Bread uh, pictured Christ, who had to be raised up first, totally just the grain, and says the, the sheaf, the, the word sheaf is omer in the Hebrew, which means a dry measure of weight, and so uh, in, in most places. Um, so he's raising up this flour, and in the case of Pentecost, it was two baked loaves of bread. But in the, in the Days of Unleavened Bread, on the, on the wave sheaf day, uh, the first fruits of the barley were lifted up to God in heaven to be accepted. Let's read it. Leviticus 23, 9 to 11. And then Jehovah spoke to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them, when you enter the land I'm giving you and reap its harvest, you are to bring the first sheaf of your harvest, the first omer, to your priest. And he will wave the sheaf. It's a certain amount of uh, flour beaten and, and sifted very, very fine before Yehovah, so that you may be accepted. So Christ said to Mary Magdalene, you can't cling to me. You touch me now. You can't cling to me. I have to go to, and tell, tell, tell the brothers, tell everybody, I go to my God and your God. I go to my uh, uh, father and your father. And so that's what he did. And then once that wave sheaf is offered up, the harvest, the rest of the harvest could start. So Pentecost is intricately tied into wave sheaf. I've been preaching that for many, many, many years. I gave one about 10 years ago on really tying the details of that together. Anyway, so after it's happened, the 50-day count to Pentecost begins. That's what Pentecost means, 50th. And it also means, in Hebrew, Shavuot, which means weeks, or Sabbath, weeks. So let's read it this time in verse 15, Leviticus 23, verse 15. I'll read it out of the Holman translation. You're to count seven complete weeks or Sabbaths, starting from the day after the Sabbath. And the word there for Sabbath is Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, not the holy day. This is not talking about day 15 uh, as being the Sabbath, the holy day of uh, the, the day of uh, the Feast of uh, Abib, the, the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread. No, it's not talking about that. It's talking about the weekly Sabbath that falls between the first and last holy day. Starting from the day after the weekly Sabbath, okay, from the Sabbath, the day you have brought the sheaf of your presentation offering, you are to count 50 days until the day after the seventh Sabbath. 50 days after the seventh Sabbath. It's the way the complete, I mean, the Holman puts it. And then present an offering of new grain to Jehovah, to the Lord. Bring two loaves of bread from your settlements as a present. Now, this is Pentecost now. Bring two loaves of bread from your settlements as a presentation offering, each of them made from four quarts of fine flour, baked with yeast as first fruits. So he's saying very clearly, the, the, uh, Christ is the first of the first fruits, but these two leavened loaves made of yeast, with yeast, are elevated to God, are raised to God, and are considered first fruits to God. First fruits. And you'll see in a minute that we are called first fruits, of course. That's the only time leaven was allowed to be in the tabernacle or, or the temple for any kind of offering or sacrifice. And on the day of, on the feast of Pentecost, on the feast of Shavuot, the first fruits, feast of weeks, Feast of Sabbaths, really, the day after the seventh Sabbath, uh, we are raised up, pictured by the two leavened loaves. So let me say it again. I've said this before, the two loaves are leavened. We have sinned in our lifetime, and we continue to stumble in sin from time to time. But something really neat, inspiring, encouraging about leavened loaves is that once you bake that leaven into the loaf, it's done leavening. It can't, you can't put that leavened loaf beside something unleavened and expect it to leaven it. it. It won't. It's done leavening. In the same way, we're supposed to be done with living a life of sin. We no longer find it entertaining to watch sinners sin. And if you are watching TV shows and others where you're watching sinners sin, uh, bare minimum, I hope we all feel bad about that. We feel terrible. We repent. Or if we find entertainment in bad language. Uh, why? Why would we do that? 
We're done with it. We're done being leavened. So the two leavened loaves are raised up, and we're done with it, though. We still sin from time to time, but not as a way of life, okay? So what do we have so far? The whole context of Revelation 19, the whole context is it's up there in heaven, the wedding, right? The four living creatures are there, the seraphim, the, uh, the 24 elders, they're there. And a voice from heaven, in heaven, all of that. A picture of Isaac marrying Rebekah, putting her into Sarah's tent that Paul says in Galatians 4, pictures heavenly Jerusalem above, Mount Zion above. Christ says he's going to uh, go prepare a place for us, come and get us and take us back. John 14, the two leaven loaves are raised up to where? To heaven and then brought back again. And we know then that the wedding will take place in heaven, nowhere else, in heaven. We know the resurrection takes place at the last trump. Most of us feel the last trump mentioned is the seventh trump. So you have seven seals that are open first as we come to the last days. And then the seventh seal has seven trumpet plagues in it. Seven trumpets are blown. And then the last trumpet has seven final plagues of God's wrath. You don't want to be uh, on the receiving end of God's wrath. He gets angry finally hard enough. You want nothing to do with that. So we want to be God's people. We want to disavow anything to do with the beast's power, his number, his system. I think we're beginning to see hints of that already beginning to happen all around us. Now, let's go to Revelation 11. Just before the seventh trumpet sounds, something dramatic happens. The two witnesses in Jerusalem, Revelation 11, the first few verses talks about how they're doing all these things and finally the beast power destroys them, kills them, and they're lay, laying dead on the street for three and a half days. And then in verse 11, Revelation 11, verse 11, after the three and a half days, and they had been celebrating their death, they were happy they were killed, the, the, I mean the, the world was. And the whole world saw this, which is a prophecy that there'd be possible for the whole world to see it, which we can now do, of course, through Zoom and and video and TV and all of that. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. The breath of life, I mean, God blew into Adam's mouth and nostrils and he became a living soul. Here again, God blows into them, gives them the breath of life and they're resurrected. And they heard a loud voice from heaven say, from where? From heaven, saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. Their enemies saw them in the same hour. There was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. And in the earthquake, uh, 7,000 people are killed in Jerusalem, I guess. And the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. And then verse 15 then the seventh angel sounded. We believe that's the last trump. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. Have you ever fallen on your face to worship? Ever? One of the things I try to do in this website is introduce you to new things maybe you're not, you've read about, but it hasn't sunk in. Once in a while, fall on your prostrate onto the floor, head to the ground, head on the carpet, head on the dirt if you're outside. Pray to God sometimes like the 24 elders did. Like people did when the clouds came in and the glory of God filled the temple. Don't be afraid to try new things, to raise your hands in prayer. I gave a sermon on Raising holy hands. I hope you guys will hear it and do it. Revelation eleven nineteen, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, great hail. So the seventh trumpet does seem to be the last trumpet. We read what happens in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 to 17. And it says, Therefore the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Why are there two leaven loaves? I really believe now, I said it differently in my sermon, but I really believe now I heard someone else's sermon on it, which I think made it a lot clearer on this point. The two loaves represent all those, that, like Paul separates them into two groups here. 
those who have died in Christ, those who have died in faith, and those who remain alive. They're all first fruits. So it says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So I think it's really probably the correct explanation to say that the two loaves picture those who had died before and those who remain alive at Christ's return. But they're first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 to 52 tell us that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is not the lion and the lamb, folks. It's not every man, flesh and blood, sitting under his fig tree. That's the millennial reign, but the kingdom of God is spirit. The kingdom of God has always been. Talk more about that some other time. Um, Behold, I tell you a mystery, verse 51, 1 Corinthians 15. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, just that fast, like a blink at the last trumpet. Trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. And in other words, we can't die anymore. Can't die. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 49. We'll go ahead and start putting this on the, on the screen behind me. Uh, the resurrection from the dead, our body is sown in dishonor, but it's sown in glory. It's raised in glory. Verse 44, it's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body, spirit beings. The first man, Adam, was dust, so we were dust. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, so we're going to be the same way, he says. And then in verse 48, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so are also those. In other words, we're going to be just like the second Adam, like Jesus Christ. And as we born the image of Adam, the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, Christ. So we're changed to spirit. We must be. I'll talk more about this next time also. We're changed to spirit. Why? Because we can't be a different kind than the one we're marrying. The, one, the marriage of God to Israel was just a type, a picture. But the reality is we have to be the same kind. I'll talk much more about that next time. But we are not going to be angels. We're not going to be animals. We're not going to be plants. We're not going to be flesh and blood humans. We are going to be like he is. We shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. So we change the spirit because we have to be the same kind of being. But the context is we meet Christ in the air and then from there we see more happening. We're also shown that there's 144,000 in Revelation 14 uh, that are up there in heaven. They're called first fruits. Uh, they're, they're, it's said that they always will follow the Lamb everywhere he goes. I'll bring it up again next time, more detail. It doesn't call them the bride. It doesn't call them the bride. I know some of you insist the whole entire first resurrection is entirely 144,000. I'll show you next time why that's very wrong concept. But whether the bride is 144,000, the Bible doesn't really tell us for sure. It says they are first fruits. But are all the first fruits going to be the bride? In any wedding I've been to, the bride and groom are always in the distinct minority. The vast majority of the people at a wedding are guests and the people serving and bridesmaids and anybody but the bride and groom. There's another group of people, if it's another group, maybe it's the same 144,000. It doesn't say there's 144,000. In Revelation 15, verses 2 and 3, I'm just kind of leading up to the next sermon now. And I saw something like a sea of glass. Where's the sea of glass? Where's the sea of glass? It's up there in heaven. A sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast. When's the victory over the beast take place? That's right before Christ returns. Over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. That's not talking about people who uh, are, 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 are committed to God from Adam's day or Noah's day or, or Abraham's day or Peter and Paul's day. There wasn't the beast system in the number of his name, that specific description, the 666 and all that. That's end time, end time group of people. This end time group of people seems to me to be paralleling a lot the great innumerable multitude mentioned in Revelation 7. 
So let's read what it says. Over his image, they have, they have the victory. Uh, over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So they're in heaven at this point. So Revelation 14 shows the, um, I, I think it clearly shows 144,000 are in heaven. Revelation 15, this group of people, whether they're still 144,000 or someone else, maybe they're the innumerable multitude here, because it sure describes the people as they're described in Revelation 7 about the great innumerable multitude. that They wouldn't give in to the beast power. Anyway, they're, they're there on the sea of glass. They're not called the bride here, by the way, nor are the 144,000 called the bride. Anywhere that I can see, show me if I'm wrong. But they're there, in heaven, on the sea of glass, before the throne of God. So absolutely, I'm convinced, the wedding between Christ and the bride takes place in heavenly Jerusalem. And we are that bride. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul says, you are, he says, I, I, I give you as a virgin uh, to Christ. Okay, and then in uh, Ephesians 5.32, it says that I'm, I'm, when I talk about husband and wife and all that, I'm speaking really about Christ and the church, five, Ephesians 5.32. So in part two, we'll talk a lot more about the who, who are in it, who are in the bride, who are not the bride. We'll talk about a little more about the when. We now know where. So let's talk about the when, when exactly all this takes place, how it takes place, and who will be there. And are all the people in the first resurrection, are they all the bride? I don't think so. And you'll see why. So it's an exciting wedding coming up. I want to be there. I want to be part of the bride. If God has other thoughts, and I'll do whatever God's will is. I just hope I'm there. And I hope you're there. So next time, we'll focus on the who and the when and try to wrap it up. So until next time, may Christ come soon. I hope you cherish your high, high calling. And I hope you look forward to being in the wedding supper of the Lamb, hopefully even as part of the very bride of Christ. So be sure you hear my exciting part two. And thank all of you who do take the time to write once in a while and be sure to tell others about our website if it's helping you. And I just ask, Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you in Yeshua's mighty name that you will put a blessing on those who hear it. Father, times are getting very dangerous. Perilous times shall come. We're, we're watching it. I ask for special protection on those who are hearing this and on all your people all around the world. And I pray to God in heaven that we will all learn to cherish our calling very, very deeply because it's such a high calling. Help us to love you more, Father. Help us to love you more, Yeshua, our Savior, our husband-to-be. Help us be at one with you. Help us love you. Help us obey you. We want to be your friend. We want to be the one that you love. We want to be the one you trust because we trust in you. We ask for your safekeeping now. We ask that we will all be there at the first resurrection. Praise you, dear Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, our Savior. Thank you so much. Father in heaven, thank you for being the awesome, most high God. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos over 270 sermons and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.